Well, happy Sunday. It's a privilege again to come and to open up the Word of God with you all. We had a time to worship our great God. Now we have a time to listen to Him as He speaks to us in His Word. Would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 21? We're again in a series on studying through the life of Jesus Christ. And and we're approaching the end of His life, uh, uh, perhaps more accurately to say, the last week of His life when He begins to teach and preach and, and set the tone what uh, uh, what is the, the, the church going to be like as he leaves this world and also what his condemnation of hypocrisy of the Pharisees uh, is going to be. And so what we are seeing today is Matthew chapter 21 verse 23 to 32. If you turn with me there, we'll study through Jesus' thoughts specifically on what, what does it mean to not to believe unto him, his condemnation, the unbelief, rather. This is something serious for us to take hold of, because if we don't believe unto Jesus, certainly we will face condemnation. We'll see that clear in this passage. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 21, verse 23 to 32. It says this, When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as was teaching, and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, and I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from men? As they discussed among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why did you not believe him? But we say from men, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So he answered Jesus, uh, We do not know. He said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. He went to the other son and said the same. He answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, well, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw it, do not afterward change your minds and believe him. God's word. That's bound the word of prayer. Our Father, we pray that you will impact our hearts this morning to believe. These are serious words coming from the Lord Jesus Christ regarding lives that don't believe unto you and the condemnation which they will face. We pray, Father, that we would not fall into condemnation, but rather we will be those who are uh, within your, your will or within your pleasing will, or meaning, meaning that we will have believed unto you and given our lives to you, and they find our lives to be uh, as righteous as Christ is righteous because we have inherited the righteousness of Christ. We pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and our minds, Lord, to your truth this morning. Change us and grow us according to your perfect will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? This is one of the major questions asked in our day and perhaps one of the most answered questions in our day. Well, I remember when I was taking an English class in college and I didn't have to take many English classes because I was an engineering major, but I had to take one English class and they discussed who Jesus was. And the caveat of the class is that you cannot bring your own faith into the class. It's absolutely one of the most horrendous class I have to endure. But people have all kinds of explanation what they think who Jesus is or who Jesus was. They thought Jesus was a moralist. He was a moral teacher, somebody who came and taught ideas of, of morality to the Jewish crowd and people believe unto him and certainly they would have better lives. Other people thought that Jesus was an insurrectionist, meaning that he, he kind of preached a message which kind of roused, uh, aroused the people to rebel against the Roman Empire, and that's what Jesus came to do. Other people thought that Jesus was a victim. He didn't really know what he was doing, but he was kind of caught between two powers that were at play, and because he was caught into two powers, he himself was eventually killed by the two powers. None of the people's explanation during that class was that Jesus was God and that he was in control and that he actually determined what would happen from beginning to end and that he came specifically to give his life as a ransom for many so man can be saved and be restored unto God. People didn't think that way. They just thought, well, Jesus was just a moral man, moral teacher, someone who came to do whatever he came to do to better humanity and was accidentally killed. Those were the explanations of people, of, who Jesus, of people who thought Jesus was in this world. And most people think that Jesus was a moral man. C.S. Lewis, however, 
was able to explain the three options regarding who Jesus was. He said this. He said, believing that Jesus was a moral person was absolutely not an option, in, in, specifically in, in terms of how Jesus presented himself. He said, Jesus is either a lunatic, the devil himself, or God. You really only have three options. He explained it in this paragraph, which I read to you, and I quote, he says, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil himself. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. See, C.S. Lewis is right. Jesus is either the devil himself, a lunatic, or God. You only have three options. You cannot tell him that he is a moral teacher because the things he said would not make himself a moral teacher if the things he said were indeed true or if they were false. If they were false, namely, if he knew that they were false, then he would be a devil himself because people would have believed on something that was simply false. People would have given their lives onto an eternity that doesn't exist. He would be the devil himself. He was out there deceiving other people. That would be Jesus if he knew what he said wasn't true and he said it was true. Or he would be a lunatic, meaning that he deceived himself. He thinks that he is the savior, he's the God of the universe, but he wasn't. He got all these people believing that he was one, but they were simply believing in a lunatic. If you believe Jesus is a lunatic, certainly that would be an option, given everything he said. Or he would be God. Everything he said was true, and indeed it is true. That's, a, that's your only three options. Either he's a lunatic, the devil himself, or he is God. Now, do you believe that he's a lunatic? From everything he said? Absolutely not. He's changed too many people's lives to be a lunatic. Do you believe that he's the devil himself? No, not, not really. I mean, the things he said will be too holy and too righteous to come from the devil. You are only left with one option, which is that he is God. He's the son of God. He's the savior. and He, de he, he indeed is one. That one who was proclaimed to be the Savior from ages past. Jesus is God. He is the Holy One. He is the Righteous One. He is the one who came to this earth to give his life as a ransom for men. He came because he needed to. He came because he came to save us from our sins. We are, by nature, children of wrath. We sin against God. We, we fall into our sinful nature, and each one of us all have. We have sinned against Him in our thoughts, we sin against Him in our actions. And because God is a holy God, He cannot tolerate sin in His presence. However, God is also love. And His love is expressed through the Son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth and gave His life for us. Jesus came, lived the perfect life which we couldn't live, died on the cross to pay the punishment which we couldn't pay, and rose again to show us a life which we couldn't have without Him. He is the God of the universe, and He loved us such a way to bring us back to God. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And today, for all of us who believe onto Jesus as Lord and Savior, we shall have the life which He deemed us to have, which is that we will be restored to God and be in the presence of God forever. It really makes sense in terms of eternity. It really makes sense for us to return to the Creator who created us. However, today we're going to look at a passage which tells us from a negative perspective why it does not make sense not to believe unto Jesus Christ. Negative perspective, how ridiculous it is for us not to believe unto the Savior. We're going to see three characteristics of unbelief here in Matthew chapter 21, verse 23 to 32. If we don't believe in the Lord Jesus, it's absolutely absurd for you not to. And there are three characteristics of unbelief. The first characteristic is this. It's presumptuous toward God for you not to believe unto Him. It's pre presumptuous toward God for you not to believe unto the Lord Jesus. We see this in verse 23. Verse 23 says, And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? The question the authority of Jesus Christ here in this passage. They're being presumptuous. Now before we see how presumptuous they are, we have to kind of understand what kind of authority did Jesus actually possess? How authoritative is Jesus Christ? Now, throughout the Old Testament, we see that God is authoritative. 
He is the God who rules over everything because He created everything. He has a right to determine everything. Because He created everything, He has a right to tell you and I what to do. He has authority over all His creation. He has authority over you and over me. This is said in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 through 11. Which says, remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all of my purposes. Before anything's ever been done, before anything's been created, God says, if I declare it, it will be true. All creation will follow my command because I am God. He, this is who he is. He is absolutely authoritative over us. The illustration over his, over his creation, the illustration of his authority over his creation is clearly laid out in Job chapter 38, where Job was encountering God and God told Job specifically how authoritative, how, how much authority that he has over Job and over his circumstances. Even Job didn't really understand. God says, I am God. I have the right to determine what would happen. Said this to Job. Where were you where I lay the foundation of the earth, tell me if you have understanding. Who determines measurements? Surely you know, or who stretch a line upon it. And then verse 8 says, Oh, who shut the sea with doors when it bursts out from the womb, when I make clouds his garment, and thick darkness is swallowing band, and prescribe limits on it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. I mean, God has a right to determine how far the sea is going to go. I mean, the wave's going to come crashing the sea. God says, here you go and no further. You shall not go any bit further than I command you to go. He has command over creation. He can tell anything what will happen or anything to do, whatever it, he wants the thing to do, and it will do it. And this authority is exactly the authority we see in the display of power in the life of Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus displayed this kind of authority in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 specifically was calming the storm. Remember that story? When he was in the sea and the disciples were afraid, a storm was going, the waves are tossing to and fro. Jesus was sleeping, woke up and said, Why are you so afraid? Said to the sea, Hush. Immediately the sea hushed. Molecules of the sea dropped to the seabed or dropped to the, to the sea level. And the sea became as calm as glass. I mean, if you told the wind to stop, at least the sea will kind of keep moving for a while. But immediately, everything came to a stop because why? Because he has authority over his creation. He has authority over inanimate objects, even the things that he created. Not only did he have authority over the things he created, he had authority over demonic spirits. Actually, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, just a, just a quote for you. The disciples were so afraid and so amazed at the power of Jesus, they said, what sort of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They obey Jesus. But not only did Jesus have power over the sea and the waves, he had power over demonic spirits. In Mark chapter 1, he was casting a demon out in a synagogue. The demon was causing a ruckus through this man. He said, leave. The demon left the man without hurting the man. And everybody recognized that this man was released from the demonic power. They said this of Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 27. They were all amazed. And they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. So Jesus had authority over his creation, over the sea, over the inanimate objects. He had authority of demonic spirits. Not only did he have authority over demonic spirits, he had authority over people, their healing. And also their salvation. It was seen in Matthew chapter 9. We said to a paralytic, be healed. And also said to a paralytic, your sins are forgiven. The people were grumbling. Said, who can forgive sins but God? Jesus said this of himself in Matthew chapter 9, verse 5 through 7. For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise up, pick up your bed, and then go home. He rose and went home. Puts the question to rest. What does Jesus have in terms of authority? He has authority to heal. He has authority to forgive sins. He has authority over all creation. By his works, he demonstrated that he was God. Not only was he demonstrating by his works that he had authority, he demonstrated that he had authority with his words. With his words. 
In Matthew chapter 5, we see Jesus Christ demonstrating that he can dismantle the traditions of the elders, the traditions of the scribes, whatever it is they thought were right, whatever it is they thought that it means to obey God, they just dismantle it by five simple words, but I tell you, or but I say to you, five simple words. See, the Jewish people had traditions. They had oral traditions, passed all the way down from the Babylonian period where they say, well, this is exactly what it means to live for God. But Jesus came saying, no, this is what it means. We see Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22 regarding murder. They were saying, well, you have heard, it was said to those of old, you have heard this tradition, you shall not murder, whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But Jesus says in verse 22, but I say to you, whatever they say didn't matter, I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So regarding murder, completely change the command, completely change the scene and say, hey, it's not about your outward appearance. It's, about what, it's not about what you do on the outside. It's about what you do on the inside. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, 28, regarding adultery, you've heard it was said, you should not commit adultery. Verse 28, but I say to you that everyone who looks at the woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, regarding divorce, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32, they had an idea, right? It was said, so and so. But verse 32, I say to you that everyone divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual morality makes her commit adultery. Whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I mean, we study through all this, right? Jesus was commanding people, saying this is the truth. And I say it's the truth. The reason why it's the truth is because I say it. I'm not quoting from anyone else. I'm quoting myself because I am the authority of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 and 34, regarding swearing, you have heard it was said, right? So this and that. But Jesus said in verse 34, but I say to you, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 and 39, regarding revenge, you have heard it was so, or you heard it was said in such a, such a way. But verse 39, but I say to you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 34 to 44, regarding love, you have heard it was said, this and that. But verse 44, I say to you. I can tell you exactly what does it mean to follow God. You have heard it was said a long time ago, all these traditions, all these things that people have said, this is what it means to follow God. I cancel it all out with five simple words, but I say to you. Why is he able to do this? Because he was God. He demonstrated he was authoritative through his, authoritative through his works. He demonstrated he was authoritative with his words. And a couple of weeks ago, we saw how his authority played out and how he threw everybody out of the temple. You saw that, right? We saw this a couple of weeks in chapter 21, verse, well, 1 through verse 11. Threw everybody, uh, actually verse 12 through verse 17. Threw everybody out. They had a tradition going on. Probably from decades past, 100 years past, people were buying and selling animals. They were doing it for their own sake. They were making money from other people. And Jesus threw them all out. Say, hey, do not make my father's house a den of robbers. I mean, people didn't even resist him. The animals had to go. People had to go because he was God. He demonstrated he was God with his works. He demonstrated he was God through his works. He gave, gave the explanation, this is my father's house. I have the right to determine what to happen here. And you have to listen. He is the authoritative God. And people had to listen. Initially, they were shocked. But right now, what we see here in verse 23 is the Pharisees are trying to make a comeback. They're thinking, you know what, we're, we're taken by surprise and we had to, I don't know what really happened. We listened to this guy, but now we have to come back because we don't want this guy taking over. We're the ones in charge, right? We're the authority of this place. We're the ones who are, who are in charge of God's temple. So we're coming back to Jesus in verse 23. What we say is, what we see is that they are questioning Jesus. They're saying, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority. This is the day after Jesus tossed everybody out and questioned Jesus. Two questions. Whose authority are you acting on and, by whose, uh, and also what kind of authority do you have? Who gave you this authority? They question Jesus' authority because that's how they function. In that world, in order for you to teach something, in order for you to do something, in order for you to stop doing something, you have to ask the Sanhedrin. You have to ask those who are the ruling council. You have to ask those who are the chief priests and the scribes. If they say yes, then you get to do it. If they say no, then you can't do it. And Jesus never really approached them. He just simply did what he did because he was God. And they come to Jesus and say, well, Jesus, by what authority? And they're hoping to catch Jesus to say something that's quite blasphemous. And maybe they can kill Jesus on that account. So they question the authority of Jesus Christ. By the way, this is nothing new. 
This is how we also live, how people also in this world live, question the authority of Jesus, because it's the first step that you must make in order to give reason to yourself why you would not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to question the authority of Jesus. See, every religion in this world, they don't believe in Jesus except for Christian faith or the true Christian faith. They have some kind of opinion about Jesus. They do. Muslims have an opinion about Jesus. They think that he's a prophet. Not as great a prophet as Muhammad, but he's a prophet. Not God. His authority is lesser than that of God. You have the Jews who think that Jesus is just a moralist or moral rabbi who was mistaken and people shouldn't believe unto him. He's not God. He's much less than God. You have the Buddhists who might think that Jesus traveled all the way from Jewish nation to India to study there when he was from age 12 to age 30 and came back to teach the Jews whatever he learned from the yogis there. That's what the Buddhists and the Hindus believe. But he's definitely not God. You have the cults, right, who believe that Jesus was just a God. The Mormons believe that Jesus is a God who you and I can become like one day. Or Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that Jesus was a creation of God, a creator, creative being of God. Catholics believe that Jesus is less than Mary, who had to listen to the request of his own mother. Jesus is less than that all-powerful God. Why? Because they don't want to believe. They want to cancel his authority to give reason to themselves why they would not embrace him as their Savior. Why they should not listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why they should not embrace all that he is and fall his feet and say, You are my Lord and my God and worship him. You know, we studied through church history. One of the things that we listened, to, we studied through was the Thomas, Thomas Jefferson Bible. Have you heard about that? Thomas Jefferson Bible is a Bible that he cuts out, all, cuts out all the miracles of Scripture, only leaving the moral portions because he thinks that's what's going to be helpful for him and for other people. Cuts out all the miracles, cuts out the feeding of 5,000, cuts out the walking on the water. The interesting part about the Thomas Jefferson Bible, and, and it's Thomas Jefferson who did this, is that the book of John actually just ends in chapter 19. You know, it doesn't have chapter 20, chapter 21, it doesn't have the resurrection. It ends in chapter 19. And I quote, it ends with this. This, this Bible actually sits in uh, Smithsonian here or there in Washington, D.C. If you want to go and check it out. But it ends with this in chapter 19. That's the Thomas Jefferson Bible. It says, it's now in the place where it's crucified. There was a garden, and the garden was a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. And there lay Jesus, and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher, and departed. That's how the book of John ended. They buried Jesus and they departed and that's it. That's the end of Jesus' story. That's what the founding father, Thomas Jefferson, believed. Did not want to believe in Jesus. Did not want to bow down to him as Lord and Savior. Because he just only... Well, because he didn't... Why? Because he didn't believe in the authority of Jesus Christ. He did not believe that he was God. But he was God. And he is God. And that's the reason why we believe. In fact, the Bible has ever made it so clear that he is God himself. He has all the authorities of the heavens and the earth. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And Jesus says, hey, all the authority in heaven and earth has been handed to me. Baptize them in my name. I mean, who is he? If not God. Telling his disciples to baptize people in his own name. Equating himself with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Is he God? Absolutely he is. He's from all the way in the beginning to all the way to the end. John chapter 1 verse 1 through 3 says it's about Jesus Christ. In the beginning there was word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that made was made. You know who made everything you know, in Genesis account? Jesus. Amen. Jesus made everything. Amen. Not only did he make everything, or did he make everything, he's going to be there when all things come to an end, before the eternal days. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 to 13 says, this, Behold, I'm coming soon, being my bring my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am what? The Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. You will be there forever in the beginning, forever in the end, right? From beginning to the end. That's who Jesus is. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. He is the all-authoritative one. So it would pre be presumptuous for us to question his authority. He's been around since 
Very beginning, before, it, before even time was there, he was there. He will be there in the end. So it's presumptuous to question God. That's why it's absurd and ridiculous to not to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are a couple of other characters that we're going to see here. The second character is why it's ridiculous, absurd not to believe is this. It's ridiculous because it's dishonest if you don't believe. It's dishonest if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see this in verse 24, 27. 24. Jesus answered them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from men? Discussed among themselves, saying, well, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then do we not believe him? But if we say from men, we're afraid of the crowd. They all hold that John was a prophet, so answered Jesus, we do not know. <laughs> so stop right there for a sec. This is their answer. It's an absolutely dishonest answer. I will show you why. First, before we understand this passage, I'll kind of talk a little bit about John the Baptist. We kind of went through a season in Matthew when we spoke on John the Baptist, but we'll do a little review. John the Baptist is a, well, was a forerunner of Jesus Christ. He's the one who comes to tell the people of God the Messiah is coming, to prepare people's hearts for Jesus. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, speaks about John the Baptist and says this, A voice cries out in the world. It's a prophecy regarding him. A voice cries out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level. And the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's... Amen. That's, that's what John the Baptist came to. That's what the Lord is. God will reveal His glory and there's going to be a voice crying out in the desert saying, prepare the way for this glory to come through. Amen. That's John the Baptist. God's going to come after John the Baptist introduced him. And Jesus did. Jesus did. John the Baptist was faithful, by the way. He said this in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Preparing people's hearts for the Lord. He says, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. With the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He says, there's one coming who is much greater than I. I'm not even worthy to tie up his shoes or untie his shoes. He will do a much greater ministry than I will ever do. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He pointed straight at Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 29, to all his disciples saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And two of his disciples, John and Andrew, followed Jesus after that. They were first following John the Baptist, but now they're following Jesus. Because John the Baptist was very, very clear to everybody that this is the Messiah. That's one job, this God, okay? Got one job. Okay? He did it well. He did it well. He proclaimed the Lord Jesus Christ. He prepared people's hearts for the Lord. The way he did it was through baptism. Was what is baptism all about? He actually called people to get baptized, not the same way of New Testament baptism, but the but the uh, uh, Old Testament ritualistic baptism, symbolizing that they're willing to admit that they're sinners before God and are willing to admit that they need cleansing from God. This is a symbol of them receiving God's cleansing. So he told everybody who would come. Right, to the, and this is said to various people, to the tax collector. He told them in Luke chapter 3, verse 13. He says, hey, you've sinned against God. You're collecting more than you're authorized to do. So don't collect any more you're authorized to do. Right? Don't steal from other people. To the soldiers, say, you need to repent. Luke chapter 3, verse 14. Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation. Be content with your wages. Don't extort people. Be faithful to do your job. He said in Luke chapter 3, verse 10, to all the people, right, love, be loving to one another. If you're selfish, that's sin. But it says, whoever has tunics to share, share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to, to, is to do likewise. Say, hey, repent. Repent of your sins. You know that your sin, I'm pointing out your sins to you, and you you're, repent of your sins. Be cleansed before God. Recognize your sins, and therefore you get yourself ready for the Messiah as He comes. And baptism was a way of physically demonstrating that they needed a Savior. And when Jesus came, He was that Savior. Now, the Pharisees had to kiss up to John the Baptist. They kissed up to John the Baptist because John the Baptist was very, very popular. You know, he had a prophetic voice. He was telling people, these are the sins of this world. Like you listen to a preacher, the preacher's right, he's on the spot. 
It's like, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. Everything it says about our country, everything it says about this nation, everything it says about the condition of the Christian in our country, condition of the Christian uh, uh, communities in our country is true. It's like, yeah, you're right. We need repentance. So the preacher is right. Like everybody saw following John the Baptist. John the Baptist was very, very popular. The Pharisees realized that. They need to kind of kind of kiss up to John the Baptist because everybody believed that John the Baptist was a prophet. He came the way of the prophet. And he, everything he said was very prophetic and very true. Everybody believed that everything he was saying is right. So Pharisees was coming to John the Baptist saying, well, we have to kind of make up you know, kind of kiss up to him because if we don't, then we're in trouble. So in Matthew chapter 3, he came to get baptized by John the Baptist and John the Baptist, of course, did not take the bait and warned them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So you guys are just doing it for show. You don't really care about God. You don't really want to repent. You just want to maintain your status quo. You don't want people rising up against you. You just want me to kind of come behind you and support you in a way that which you are, well, Distorting the truth. So John the Baptist wouldn't baptize them. And, and they were at odds. Did not believe in John the Baptist. Did not really know what to do with him. Just kind of stayed away from this man. And when John the Baptist passed away or died because Herod killed him, they just said, you know what? Good riddance. We don't have to deal with this guy anymore. Whew. Finally. We can just go about our ways, sit on top of religious hierarchy, collect our money, whatever it is, be respected by people, being comfortable position that we're in. We don't have to deal with John the Baptist anymore. But you know what? They have to deal with Jesus now. Yeah. And dealing with Jesus is like dealing with John the Baptist in the sense that John the Baptist and Jesus are together. They're all, I mean, John the Baptist is supporting Jesus. And Jesus got himself on the same side. So Jesus asked him a question. What do you think? John the Baptist, his baptism, is it from man? Or is it from God? Is it from heaven or from earth? They say, you know what, we, we, we don't really want to answer that question because if we say from heaven, then we have to admit that we have to follow Jesus. Jesus says, hey, I will answer your question. By what authority I do this thing? If you answer this question, you will already know by what authority I do these things because by your own answer, you have to answer your question. You have to answer your own question. If you say that John the Baptist's baptism was from heaven, then you would admit that my authority is from heaven because John the Baptist was pointing to me, pointing to Jesus. Oh, they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to admit that because they would have to bow down the field of Jesus and worship and believe him that he is who he says he is. And, but then they don't have any other option. They said, well, what's the other option? The other option is that we would say from man. This is the earthly ministry. This is not actually from God, but from man. They said, we don't really want to say that because everybody held John the Baptist to be a prophet. They all believe unto him. They all think that he is the one. I mean, he is the prophet of God. He's the one to, to proclaim God's ways. So, I don't want to say that because that would cause people to riot against us and they would think of us as those people who are not following God and we, we, we don't want to do that. We kind of just want to avoid the issue. We want to be comfortable. We don't want to stir the pot. So the answer I gave to Jesus is this, 27. The best answer any theologian can give from those, from those days, right? Years and years and years and years and years of study from their 13 years old and up. And these are probably 40 or 50 year old man. Best answer in verse 27. We do not know. Do not know. But they do know. They've been dishonest. They've been dishonest before God. They do know. They're just trying to maintain their political power, their religious power, but they're dishonest about it. They're like a politician who just says, you know, let, let me just kind of, kind, kind of sidestep the issue, kind of just we, uh, yield around the issue, not really answer the question. And when Jesus asks them a question straight up, People look at them, they just, they were surprised. We don't know, we don't want to answer the question. They're being dishonest. By the way, this is how people approach God as well here in this world. One man says clear, there's not an honest man in hell. Did you know that? Amen. There's not an honest man in hell. Interesting, right? Is it true? It absolutely is true. Because everybody who goes to hell has already known in their hearts they're denying the Lord Jesus or denying God to some way, shape, and form. And purposely denying him. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 through 20 says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God is showing it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, the things in the things that have been made, so they're without what? Excuse. 
The things of this world already tell people about who God is. You look at the heavens, look at the earth, look at the trees, look at the stars, look at the mountains, look at the flowers, look at the things that God's created. It already tells you that God exists and that God's a holy God. Not only does it tell you God's a holy God, it also tells you God's an extremely dangerous God because how dangerous the creation is and that you're accountable to Him. And that you can see in your heart that you do not measure up the holiness of God, that you're a sinner before God. However, most people in this world, without hearing God, without hearing the gospel, without, come, without being regenerated by God, they will automatically, in their simple nature, deny God. They will. They don't want to know God. They suppress it. That's why we go share the gospel with people. Did you know that? When we share the gospel, we, we, we're talking about this with, with our team. Whenever Wednesday, we share the gospel with people. Sometimes, before you even mention a word, you say, do you believe in Jesus? Would you like to know about Jesus? They already had the face, right? And maybe you share the gospel with your neighbor, share the gospel with your, with, with your co-workers. They already have the face. They're already angry. So we, we even say anything. Why are they angry? Why are they upset? Because it's something that which they already have suppressed for a long time. You revealed it. You revealed the emotion that have been there for a very long time. Unless they're regenerated by God, they will have suppressed the truth already. Everybody knows. Everybody knows that they're suppressing God. Everybody knows that, or everybody knows that, that God exists. They may not intentionally know that they're suppressing, but they are suppressing. And the moment they reveal it to Him, they will become upset you, and they would upset you, and they might even persecute you. But Jesus here is telling us that we need to be honest. If you're honest before God, then you will come to Him. If you're honest before God, then you will believe. Because you're honestly seeing how holy and righteous God is, you see how honestly, or if you're, seeing, if you're honest with yourself, you see how simple you are. Honesty, true honesty will lead you to God. Psalm chapter 32, verse 5. See, David is being honest after sin against God. He says this, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgive the iniquity of my sin. See, anyone who's honest will look back at your past. Not just look away, right? Sometimes we'll look away and say, you know, I don't want to think about what I did. You have lustful things that you did or, or hateful things that you did. You don't, you don't want to look at that. Say, well, I want to compare myself with other people because the only way that which I will be justified in my own eyes is if I look better than other people. But the reality is that God looks at you with a standard that's above your own standard. He looks at a standard which is his own standard. His own standard says that you are a sinner. No matter what you have, no matter what your life looks like, if you look honestly at yourself, honestly, you will see the past or the things that you've done wrong. And you say, you know what? If I if I'm honest with it, the only process I could take before the Lord and Savior is to acknowledge my sin before God and not cover up your iniquity. And God will save you. God will save you. The process is that if you confess your sin here in Psalm chapter 32, verse 5, God will forgive the iniquity of your sins. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He came, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, rose again for you, so that you may be saved. Live the life which you can live. Die the death which you couldn't die. It's the death of hell. Live again so that you may be brought back to God. So here we see clearly... First two characteristics of unbelief. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're being presumptuous toward God. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're being dishonest toward God because you don't look at your sins with an honest perspective. And thirdly, if you don't believe in Jesus, you are hypocritical before God. You're hypocritical before God. We see in the verse 27 to verse 33 or 32. So let's look at this again. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. He said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. He went to the other son and said the same. He answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, well, the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go to the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds. And believe him. Tremendous parable. But we have to kind of talk about exactly why this parable applies to this case. And this condemnation against the Pharisees. So Jesus answered the question and said, Hey, if, you don't, if you're not going to be honest with me. If you're not going to be honest and you just be, say, I don't know. If you're not going to be honest with me, then I'm not going to talk to you anymore. In fact, I will compare you to this parable of two sons. So the father had a vineyard. 
This particular father is obviously God himself, had two sons, and tells one son, says, son, go to the vineyard and work. The son says, oh, I won't go. But eventually he changed his mind and went. His other son says, I go, sir. You'll see me there. See me there. I'll be there. But did not go, didn't show up. Which of the son did the will of the father? And of course the answer is the first, the one that said that he wouldn't go, but eventually he went. You know who the first is? That's the prostitutes and tax collectors because they themselves look like they're not going to follow God. In the beginning, their lives are well full of stealing and full of fornication. It looked like they're not going to follow Jesus or follow God. But when John the Baptist came, when Jesus came and, and taught the message of the kingdom, they changed their minds and followed Him, repented of their sins and followed God. They actually did the will of the Father. And the second group are the Pharisees. I go. They're the ones who are the religious leaders. They're supposed to be the ones to tell other people what to do, how they follow God, the Messiah would to come. They'll be the first one to believe and say, here is the Messiah, everybody follow Him. The Messiah we're all looking forward to. But actually they're not the ones who truly follow Jesus. Because when Messiah did come, Messiah came and said, hey, I want leadership. Why don't you step aside and say, no, we want to maintain our leadership. We want to maintain our respective places. We want to maintain on the top of the hierarchy position. Wouldn't let go of the position. In fact, fought with Jesus, fought with John the Baptist to maintain their religious traditions. They said they would go. But indeed, they did not. They're hypocrites. So Jesus says to them in verse 33, I truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go in the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, you did not believe in him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believe in him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. They denied both the message and the power of the message. See, the message is something that we won't believe because that would change our status, that would change our, our political structure, our religious structure. So we don't want to believe the message because that would place us in a position where we're subservient to this prophet of Galilee or prophet of Nazareth, this man who claimed to be God. We don't want to do that. But when people's lives are changed, the tax collectors and prostitutes are no longer stealing, no longer fornicating, their lives are changed, they're following Jesus. They saw the power of the message, power of the gospel, they still did not believe, denying both the message and the power of the message. They were hypocrites. They simply want to maintain the religious structure, telling other people that they're doing things for the Lord, but they have absolutely no action to back it up. This happens in our world as well. Unbelief is a form of hypocrisy. It is, no matter where you're at. There's a description of hypocrisy in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 14 through 15. And you know, God actually hates hypocrisy, by the way. He wants you. He only wants one you, not two of you. Your outside had to match your inside. If you say whatever you say, who you are, does not match who you are on the inside, then you're not part of the kingdom. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 14 through 15, God condemns the religious hypocrisy of the days of Israel. Back in the days of Isaiah, it says this, Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Don't come to me telling me that you are of me. Don't raise your hands. Don't worship me. Don't, don't say these things that are holy if your lives do not measure up to it. What's the solution? Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16 or chapter 1 verse 16. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Amen. Jesus, God is not saying, hey, don't worship me. No, do worship me, but measure up, right? Plead the widow's cause. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Clean up your lives. Present one you, not two of you. Now, it doesn't mean that we're saved by our works, right? It doesn't mean that you'd be perfect in order to be saved. What it means is that you must have a true heart repentance before God. And that repentance is, is seeing your own life when you begin to see that in your life you're not holding on to any particular pattern of sin, but rather you have a pattern of living for Jesus in your life. We may still sin from time to time, but there is an honest approach in your life in which you are actually seeing the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior in your own actions that you could tell yourself. You must live a life of following Jesus. And that life must match you up to what you say you do. James chapter 2 verse 17 says this. So faith by itself, it does not have works, it's dead. 
It is. You tell people you believe in Jesus, but you don't act like you believe in Jesus, your faith is nothing before the Lord. So what do we do? We examine ourselves. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you indeed fail to meet the test? What's the test? The test is that, does my life really measure up? You begin to you sin before the Lord, and you say, you know what, this is a, a sin in my life. Is it a pattern? Or am I truly repentant of it? If you're not repentant, if you continue to sin, it's become a pattern, you have to set yourself, it's like, do I really love Jesus? Do I really love Him? If I truly love Him, then why am I doing this over and over again? Or, are you truly repentant? If you're truly repentant and say, you know what, thank you Jesus for giving my sins. I do sin from time to time, but this is not a pattern of my life. I love you more than anything else. Right? You constantly examine yourself. You're not giving a pass to yourself. Examine yourself if your life inside of you truly matches who you say you are on the outside. You don't want to present two lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to present just one life. One life. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. This is actually not many people do this, by the way. Many people are going to say, well, Lord, Lord, right? This is Jesus' condemnation to many Christians who will see him in eternity. Now everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Right? Now everyone who says the word, Lord, Lord, but the one who actually live out God's will in their lives. It's a call for us to examine ourselves. Do you, does your life measure up to what God calls you to live to? It's a constant examining and constantly cause seeking to grow in the Lord. Now for all of us here, if you don't believe in Jesus, we have these words for you. Do not be presumptuous and do not be dishonest before God. See, Jesus, God's word has been around for a long time. And it's been proven a long time. The people in this world, ever since the Enlightenment period, have tried to, well, even before that, tried to undermine the authority of Scripture. They've been around for how long? I mean, each person lived, what, 60, 70 years? People in their own thought process think of things why they should not believe in Lord Jesus Christ. But the reality is that this has been around for a long time. It's been proven. It's been around for 4,000 years, ever since it was written, the first book of, Mo- the first book of Moses in Genesis, written in 18, 1800 B.C. Back in the, or the description of it back in those days. So you, you, you have to understand this round has been around for a long time. We don't have the authority to question scripture. In fact, we're the ones in the wrong. In fact, all the disciples, they give their lives to follow Jesus. If they were not true, they wouldn't have done it. This is true. We're called to believe. We see three characteristics today. Three characteristics of unbelief. First, unbelief is presumptuous. Don't be presumptuous. Second, unbelief is dishonest. Don't be dishonest. And third, unbelief is hypocritical. Do not be hypocritical before God. Be honest and be true before God. If you are, then you will believe everything he says about Jesus in God's word. To close, I want to give you one story. This is one interesting story coming out from the church history lesson. We're going to close our church history lesson this week, but this will be encouraging to you because ever since the, the, the age of enlightenment, people have questioned the authority of scripture, questioned the authority of God. They want God, but they just don't want God of the Bible. So there's one man named Karl Barth. He was a Swiss theologian, and basically he 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 had a lot of thoughts, and and, and he he created his own thinking about who Jesus is. But and one of the thoughts that he had was that he wasn't really sure if Jesus ever resurrected from the dead. Okay, so he's he talks a lot about God, but not the God of the Bible. So so people try to get him to answer the question: Did Jesus actually resurrect from the dead? And he would never ever give a clear answer. So one time he came to America. This is the 1800s. He came to America in. Um, uh, or actually, he said the 1900s came to America. He lived through the 1800s. Now he's, he died in the early 1900s. And he came to America. He was giving lectures. And in lecture, it was a Q&A session. And one of the people sitting in the Q&A was a, name, a man named Carl Henry. Carl Henry was the editor of Christianity Today. He happened to also be the dean of Fuller Seminary. He's a man of God. Really, really loved Jesus. So he asked Carl Barth this question. So he said, well, look at all these cameras here in this room. If they were to point at the tomb... During the Resurrection Sunday, what would they see? What would they report? Would they report an actual resurrection? Or would they report something else? Now, Carbar knew what he was getting at, and he just retorted back. So he didn't want to answer this question, he retorted back. Is this Christianity today or Christianity yesterday? And the room exploded with laughter, right? Because it's just 
People were laughing at Carl Henry and laughing at this question. And Carl Henry responded with this. Forever edge in the conversation and saying this. Christianity, yesterday, today, and forever. That's his answer. Amen, right? That's never changed. Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and forever. He's the authoritative one. He's one who exists from beginning of creation to the end of everything, right? But if there's ever, ever to where the end of eternity, if there's ever an end, or forever eternity in that direction, eternity in the future, forever eternity in the past, he ever existed. He's never, ever not existed. He's the beginning, present, and the future. And we'll do well to believe unto him today. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful, Lord, for this passage in, in which we get to examine the story of Jesus and, and, and the reasons why people don't believe unto him, how ridiculous it is that they don't believe. And yet you are constantly coming to us and asking us to place faith in you. We know, Lord, that you love us. We know, Lord, that you're constantly giving the world another chance to believe. Help us, God, to believe. Help us, Lord, to, 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 to come to our true senses, our true sense, which is that you are the true God and that there's none besides you. We thank you, Lord, that you're patient with us. Lord, help us, Lord, to share the gospel. Help us, if any one of us don't believe in you today, that we will make the decision to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Place our faith in him and enjoy the salvation of the Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord. Help us, God, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.